Welcome to the tenth day of Advent of Code, where we are dealing with a pipe maze. As we arrive on the next island, we see an animal scurrying into a large, single, continuous loop of pipes. We get the layout of the area presented as a 2D grid with various connected and disconnected pipes. The animal entered the loop at the position labeled with the letter S. Given the input, how many steps along the loop does it take to get from the start of the loop to the point farthest from the start? Let's go into some examples to understand the problem and our input better. First off, let's explain the characters in our input. There are six types of pipes. First, we have the horizontal and vertical pipes, which connect north to south and east to west. Then there are four 90-degree corner pipes, which connect as you would expect. The characters used are L, J, 7, and F. Lastly, there is empty space, or just ground, indicated by a dot. The letter S indicates the starting position that is on the loop. Note that there is a pipe on S, but the shape needs to be inferred from the input. If we visualize the example input, then it looks as follows. The green corner is our starting point, and there is one big single loop. Some pipe segments and empty spaces are scattered around, but they are detached from the loop itself. The question then becomes, if I start on the green position in the loop, what is the furthest that I can travel away from the starting position? In this example, the answer would be eight segments. Given the problem description and these examples, do you already see how you can solve the problem? If you haven't already, now is a good moment to give it a go. I'll continue with the solution in this video in three, two, one. Let's build a graph from the 2D map. This can work really well because the loop has no branches, so we can just track the distance across it using, for instance, a breadth first search. The outline then looks as follows. First, we take in the grid from standard in, and for convenience, we store the number of rows and number of columns. Then, let's first find the starting position and we'll replace the letter S with the actual pipe symbol that it represents. This will help keep the sub-functions a bit simpler as it removes an edge case when building the graph. Once we have the updated grid, we'll get our adjacency list, which is the pipe graph. Given this graph and the starting location, we'll travel across the loop, which will give us our maximum distance. Now, to make today's problem a bit simpler to read, Let's handle 2D positions as tuples. These are hashable, so we can then use them as a key in a dictionary. Here is an example of how this can be done with typing in Python. A good convenience function to have is to be able to add two positions together. Next up, a trivial subproblem: finding the start position. Here we just loop over the grid and we return the position at which it is found. Slightly more involved, is generalizing the input and replacing the letter S with the pipe symbol that it represents. But given the grid and the position of the start, we can check to which adjacent fields it connects. I provide this as a tuple of directions, since every pipe connects two directions. For instance, north and south or east and south. If we have the connections, then the dictionary at the top makes it trivial to get the correct symbol into the grid. Checking for these connections isn't necessarily hard, but the code is a bit verbose. Do you have a better way of doing this? Share it in the comments below. The algorithm which I propose just checks if the field to the north connects to the south and so on. The connections get returned as a tuple, again because tuples are hashable, which is required for the lookup in the dictionary. Now, let's start building the graph. First up, here's a map that's the inverse of what we were using for the previous function. Now, given a pipe, what are the two directions that it connects to? In the case of the red pipe segment, which in the input would be the letter F, connects to the south and to the east. For every field in our grid, we can just blindly set up the connections like this. Why? Because we know that we will stay on the perfect loop so we know that the pipes will connect perfectly where it matters. Given the preparations that we did, parsing the grid into the adjacency list now is very simple. We loop over the grid and get the symbol of our current position. 
If this is actually a pipe symbol, then we grab the two offsets from the previous dictionary, and we add the neighboring positions in the adjacency list for the current node. Finally, we have our graph. Let's travel through it using a breadth first search. We will fill a makeshift queue with the first position, and we store the distance, which is zero. Then we'll keep track of the nodes, which we already visited in a set, and we create a variable to store our maximum distance. While our index i is less than the length of the queue, we know there are more elements to process. So we'll take the next one from the queue and we check its neighbors. If the neighbor has not been visited yet, they will visit it and add it to the queue. The distance will be the current distance plus one. Every time that we grab a node from the queue, we of course update the max distance, because the node which we grab might be farthest away. To visualize this, please see the graph on the right. Using a BFS, we always check all nodes at the same depth before we ever go one step deeper. First, all nodes at distance 1, then all those at distance 2, and so on until we find the maximum distance at the end. Now for part 2, we realize that we explored the loop, but we never encountered the animal which we were chasing, Maybe its nest is within the area enclosed by the loop? Given the loop in our input, how many tiles are enclosed by the loop? Here is a key example that's provided us today. Determining what's inside and what is outside is not simply checking for reachability from the positions on the outer edge of the grid. Here you see the a few fields marked with the letter O, which are both not reachable from outside the loop, but they're also not inside the loop. The total number of enclosed positions are the four fields which are labeled with the letter I. Let's jump into the solution of part two. The loop forms a polygon, or shape if you will. Checking if a point is inside or outside of any arbitrary polygon is a common problem within computational geometry. To determine if a point is on or outside of any polygon, Simply draw a line that starts at your point and ends at some location that you are 100% sure is outside of your shape. This line will, in most general cases, intersect with the edges of the shape. The edges in today's problem are our loop. Now, if the number of intersections is odd, then you know for sure that you are on the inside of the shape. If the number of intersections is even, then you are on the outside. Of course, our polygon and the points which we check are special in the sense that all points are on a grid, but the core idea still works. Let's see how. Let's take a row in our grid, and let's track the number of crossings of the red line from left to right. If we zoom in, then hopefully it becomes more apparent that we cross twice. If we go from left to right and we track crossings, then when we reach the field, we have crossed the line once, so we must be inside of the shape. Note the positions for the numbers one and two were not chosen arbitrarily. We could have also moved them to the outside by one position each, but it is important to only use one pair of complementary pipes to count the crossings. Counting the pipe all the way on the right as yet another crossing would be incorrect. Now, this may not be very intuitive, but there are three ways to cross the red line, either from top to bottom or the other way around. So, to make it more explicit, from each group we need to pick one representative. So either we pick L and J to act as markers which indicate a crossing, or we pick F and 7. I'll also show this in the code, but the small loops at the bottom hopefully also help you think about why this is the case. See how the pairs would cause us to go up and down over the red line? Let's dive back into the code. Our outline changes slightly to accommodate for the counting. From our travel function, we no longer care in getting the maximum distance, but we want to know which edges, fields, or pipes are part of our loop. This is tracked by the set of visited positions. If we have that set of visited positions, then we can use that to count which fields in the grid are inside of the loop. If we look at our updated travel function, then the key change is that we no longer care about tracking distance at all, so we can remove any logic related to that, and we're left with the following. Note that the return type has changed as well. And last, but certainly not least, 
Here is the actual counting function. For every column in a row, if that column is not part of the loop, then we check if that column, or position, is inside or outside of the loop, based on the number of crossings up to that point in the loop. So, we initialize our count to zero, and then for every row, we initialize the number of crossings to zero. Then for every column we check, is that position in the set of positions that form the edges of the loop? If it is, then we check if the symbol is any of the crossing symbols. Note that here we limit ourselves to the chosen representatives of the three crossing groups. Please try to make sure that you really understand and convince yourself of why this works, as it is key to fully understanding today's part two solution. If the current field is not part of our loop, then it's either inside or outside. To determine which of the two it is, we just have to check if the number of crossings is odd. And that's it for today's problem. I'd say part two has been above averagely tricky thus far, but I do hope that I managed to make the solution clear. Consider subscribing if you would like to stay up to date with more content like this, and for now I would say, enjoy two additional stars, and let's get back to work tomorrow.